you. All right, the combined public hearing for Council Bill 1396 and 1395 is open. Speakers uh, may offer comments on either or both of these items. Um, this is a courtesy public hearing. It is an hour long, but we got a request uh, to, to get everyone in uh, to um, comment on this. And we have 26 speakers, so we will go just over an hour uh, to make sure that we accommodate everybody. And thank you to INC for pointing out those uh, points. And um, the, the other thing that I'll say is, council members, we will vote on these items separately. Um, so I'm going to ask that the questions during the question portion, the question portions portion on 396 will be focused on 396 and 1395, focused on, on 1395. I said 396, 1396. All right. So we will focus on them um, so there's not a bifurcation issue. Okay. We are now open. The combined public hearing is now open. Uh, Jeff Steinberg will start us off with the Park Hill uh, Council Bill 171396 with the presentation. And President, we had actually started with the Greenway. Do you okay. want us to, is that okay? Or, and that, then Jeff was gonna. That's okay. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> or the contract, I should say. So Jen Hillhouse is starting with the SEMA contract. Uh, this is contract 17-1395. Okay, great. So thank you. Good evening, Jen Hillhouse with the project team. And just wanted to, I'll go through the contract section. Um, and then as president said, um, Jeff will uh, take us through the land acquisition ordinance. <coughs> thank you, Angela. And so just to start with kind of the contract terms, um, this is a design build contract and SEMA has been the selected team. It's a lump sum contract of $78.2 million. Um, the term will extend from January of this month to, or this year, 2018, through July of 2020. And we did go through our DSBO professional service goals committee to get our goals, which were a design of 23% and the construction of 12%. The Greenway, as most of you know, extends from Franklin to Steele. It will add 12 new acres of open and recreational space for the Cole and Clayton communities and, and the surrounding neighborhoods. But we know that you're tired of trying to explain this project, so we thought we'd show you. Um, and I might need your help, Angela, to get that video back up. All right, do I minimize this? Excuse me. Mr. President? Yes, Question. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Do we have this presentation in our materials? I can't find it. All right. Um, yes, I do believe we had it. Angela, do we have this presentation? No. Not the video. Not the video. Okay, okay. I don't see the PowerPoint in here either. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, but we can get that to you. So you guys have seen this, but again, starting at Franklin Street, this is the Greenway. You can see that it's landscaped, it has trees. Um, we have a shared street on the uh, left-hand side that you're going by. It's flanked by uh, shade structures and really starting to create a place where people are gonna come and enjoy um, with their family and friends, a gatherings place. Uh, Gilpin Street Ped Bridge, we have two pedestrian bridges that will work to align um, the fabric of, of the existing community. William Street here, as you see that we're going over, this is a multimodal um, bridge that will include vehicles. Now here is just east of Williams is the heart of the Greenway. Um, we have low flow crossings, amphitheater seatings, flexible lawn space. All these things were really important as we worked through the community to start and design. Um, we have the nature play and exercise equipment, and then that's bounded by High Street Ped Bridge. Um, all, the, most of the time this uh, greenway will be dry outside of major events and, you know, it has a multi-use path along the whole entire length of it. And so not only is it working for conveyance um, and for that park-like and kind of recreational ability, but it's also providing needed water quality in the basin um, that will actually clean the water before it gets into the river. So going back, we just wanted to show you a little clip of that. We, SEMA developed that tool um, as part of the contract and that came with their proposal. And this will be a tool that we use throughout our community process to really, as we refine with the community um, and work through that design and construction, we'll use that tool to communicate. So going back to more of the kind of the details, we, this project is within the um, I-70 VB, I-70 Superfund site. 
Uh, the good news is, is that most of, um, we've done multitude of various amount of testing, and the majority of the project falls well below um, EPA uh, levels in, of concern. Um, so that's the good news. Of the material that we know we're gonna find, right, we have lead, we have arsenic, um, the landfills, the, those things that we know we're gonna find, we will have an MMP, a materials management plan put in place um, for the project that the contractor will have to follow. And, Sorry about that. And so the, the materials management plan that will be created, we will um, make sure that the contractor follows. We will have an MMP supervisor on site daily and any of the materials of concern will be um, excavated and handled appropriately. We also will have proactive air monitoring, so usually we don't do air monitoring until we find something. Here with this project, we've made a commitment, it's very important to the community, um, that we do proactive air monitoring. We'll also do um, dust control, and the contractor will be required to have an approved plan by the city that manages that dust in, in a, a, a good manner. Uh, noise is the same way, right? So they can only work um, at the appropriate times that the per permit will allow them to. Fencing, we usually have a six foot fence. We work with a contractor in the residential areas that we're gonna increase that to eight feet. Again, just for the perception, making sure that we're having a good visual barrier as well as um, any other impacts. Uh, traffic and communication. So traffic, we will have to maintain access to businesses and residential um, owners, the residents at all times. Um, and we're gonna work to communicate that in advance, be very proactive on our communication. Can you hold on for two yes, seconds? Yes, and I was gonna hand it to Jeff. But oh, you know. are, okay. Well, I just wanted to, to let uh, Councilman Flynn, you said you couldn't pull, the, the, we figured it out, it was on 1396, so now oh. you, you're able to pull up all of what you just saw on 1395. Right there. Okay. All right, great. So I was gonna hand this over to Jeff to talk through Park Hill Land Acquisition Ordinance. Okay. Now we're going back to 1396 city council members. Good evening, council members. I'm Jeff Steinberg. I'm director of real estate for the city in Kenya, Denver. Good transition timing, Councilman Brooks. Um, so uh, the land acquisition ordinance uh, is a common tool that the city uses uh, for acquiring property and property interests uh, to construct um, uh, public projects. Recent uh, uh, scenarios where we've done this is for the National Western Center, for South Broadway, for Federal, and for the 39th Avenue Greenway portion of this project. It's the first step in allowing the city to work with the property owners to um, access land for the purpose of the detention project. Uh, the city intends to uh, follow the Uniform Relocation Act as a guideline. There aren't federal monies in this project, so we're not required to, but that's what we have been using and will continue to use. Um, it includes a process to ensure that the property owners uh, and leasehold interests are fairly compensated, and that will all be part of the upcoming negotiation process. Uh, the process will consist of, uh, well, the property itself has one legal address, so the property will be noticed. Um, the detention area that is anticipated will be required with, is somewhere between 25 and 35 acres for the permanent easement aspect and then an additional 55 to 65 acres for temporary easement. So uh, provided that the ordinance is passed, we will send a notice of intent to the property owner, uh, engage a, an appraiser to come up with values of each of the respective easements that are required. Um, the entire golf course uh, is gonna be closed down for the duration of the project, which is anticipated to commence uh, January of 19 and last uh, basically to the end of the year. And then um, I'll go on, we, we see March 2020 is the anticipated completion. And that is uh, also looking at the timing of the uh, reconstruction of the project to bring it back to a playable golf course. Um, so the benefits, it says relocation benefits, and that's ultimately the benefits that are gonna be paid to bring the property back to being a payable golf course. So we'll engage a golf course ar architect 
uh, will obtain bids to reestablish it as a golf course, develop a timeline for construction, and then determine what the um, damages is to all uh, interest owners of the project. That's what we had for you today, and we're available for questions. Okay. No other material? No. Okay. All right. We have uh, 26 speakers uh, today. I'm going to call, uh, if you guys can um, go find a, another place to sit, it would be great. Um, I'm going to call the first five speakers uh, to keep us uh, running pretty quickly. Um, we are going to just ask these five speakers to come up, and as soon as they're done, we're going to ask the next five. Um, so thank you. All right, uh, Maggie Price, Deborah Montoya, Trina Moya, uh, Justin Feeder, and Jeff Rom Romeo. I believe that's five. All right, Ms. Price, you're up first. My name is Maggie Price, and I live at 1465 Fillmore Street. Thank you for this courtesy hearing and the opportunity to speak. In April of 2017, the Interneighborhood Cooperation Delegates voted for a resolution to encourage the city to acquire Park Hill Golf Course if it became available and called upon the public officials of the city and county of Denver, quote, to commit to the preservation of Park Hill Golf Course and thereby prevent all or any part of it from being developed other than for parkland. In November of 2017, and after an announcement of acquisition of the course, the INC delegation again approved a second resolution that in part called upon the public officials of the city and county of Denver, one, to amend the proposed contract between Denver and Clayton regarding the Park Hill golf course so as to remove Clayton from being the lead of the visioning master plan process and to delete from the proposed contract reimbursement to Clayton for any participation it may cho chose to undertake in the planning process and two, to commit again to the preservation of Park Hill Golf Course property as parkland open space. If the opportunity arises again to purchase <coughs> this property, I urge you to keep this land as open space parkland as an investment in the health of our city and a rare gift to its citizens. Many people have commented that the land's close proximity to rapid transit make it an ideal for development. However, its closeness to transit also provides a speedy means for our citizens to enjoy a large urban open space without having to go to the mountains. Please allow this land to remain cement free and to do what it can do best, provide green space for people to recreate to absorb and filter water, and to assist in the mitigation of flooding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Price. And I wanted to point out to folks speaking, just make sure you uh, specify what uh, bill you're speaking on. So 1395, 1396, the Park Hill, or the 39th Avenue Channel. Okay. Um, and if you're speaking on both, you can say both. Uh, Ms. Deborah Montoya. Um, good evening, community. Um, my name is Deborah Montoya. I live at 3924 William Street. I'm a lifelong resident of Curtis Park Coal Community. Um, my home immediately borders the proposed 39th channel slash greenway. I was able to have myself appointed to the community working group for planning and design on this greenway. The infrastructure change in our neighborhood was necessary to avoid flooding during massive storms, of which I have experienced many times on the north side of 39th Street. In designing, my emphasis was to secure that construction would mitigate any toxicity in the earth left behind by industry and to secure that the channel would be a beautifying, natural, and serene addition to our community. I believe wholeheartedly that our working group accomplished this and that this greenway will enhance our community with a beautiful natural environment, active amenities for all age groups to enjoy, and create an infrastructure that will protect the neighborhood from flooding in the future. I fully support the construction of this greenway. Um, although I may not be able to um, enjoy it. 
um, the process as expected over time, the return of the Anglo population to the inner city has been met with new city investment. For myself, since December of 2015, my home has been threatened with imminent domain, plight, blight designation, and height rezoning that now invites high-powered developers and realtors to manipulate the market and homeowners to their advantage. This leaves me and others like me not knowing what the future holds. Even if I could get the best market price, I could never afford another home in my community. If I stay, could I pay the taxes? If I don't sell at the most opportune moment, might I end up this small home surrounded by high rises that would overshadow me and swallow me up? As if I have gone through the process of, the, of finding my bearings in all of this I, and observing how the city planning committees work, Denver city planning has no human component. Our council members seem disinterested and even dismissive in providing any help to residents or even listening to our concerns. Yet they seem very concerned with what is in the best interest of business and development and not the residential community, especially those who are poor, elderly, and of course, people of color. There is no city agency um, um, or council on homeowners' rights and protections from abuse. Denver Planning works with numerous private businesses to accomplish their goals. They all get a piece of the pie, either payment directly from the city, contracts, incentives, or other compensation. Yet Denver Planning sees no need to address this human factor. If the city of Denver can pay bazillions of dollars to uplift every business partner in their plans, then it doesn't seem unreasonable to pay for at least a central helpline. Is that too much to ask? No, it's not. So let me ask for more. Give us tax breaks so we can stay in our homes and continue to be the upstanding contributing residents of our lifelong communities. And or supplement us like you supplement businesses so that we don't end up displaced and in poverty. Be accountable, Denver. Be accountable, Denver Planning. Be accountable, Mayor Hancock. Ms. Be accountable, council people. Ms. Be Montoya. accountable. Um, how will you help Ms. these Montoya. constituents? We cannot stop progress. Ms. And Montoya. if we must move, we will. Your but our time city is, uh, can guarantee that this movement th is you. done with dignity, thank you, earned Ms. Montoya. by long-time keepers, preservers, Ms. and Montoya. diversity of this community. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montoya. All right. Um, Ms. Trina Moya. My name is Trina Moya. I'm a resident of the Cole neighborhood. Um, I'm speaking on 1396, I think, the 13, 39th Avenue ditch. Um, I just want to clarify, although I'm a member of the Cole Neighborhood Association Board, the following comments are my own opinions. While I've been a resident of the Denver metro area for 32 years, I've only lived in Cole for six years. I recognize that I'm a part of the gentrification of Cole and surrounding areas, and I stand here today in what I see as taking responsibility for my indirect role in bringing the type of development to the area that has resulted in projects like Platte to Park Hill. I was one of the community members who spoke to you on December 18th about our concerns with potential environmental hazards along 39th Avenue, which has brought us to this courtesy hearing. I subsequently met with my neighbors to discuss which of the many points we wanted to stress tonight in our allotted three minutes that might persuade you all to hear us and grant our request to delay the approval of the SEMA contract until a full environmental risk analysis can be completed. The city has thousands of paid employees and contractors to call upon to defend their decisions. People who spend 40 or more hours a week preparing reports full of specialized data to justify those decisions. People whom the city can call forward as experts because they're paid as experts. Meanwhile, we the citizens must use the few hours we have free each week to wade through and decipher the technical information from those reports, to do research, and to attend a myriad of related meetings just to figure out what exactly is planned for our neighborhoods and how we may be impacted. It really feels like a David and Goliath scenario, but as one of my neighbors rightfully pointed out, the burden should not be on us to prove to you why this project should be put on hold until a full analysis com is completed. The burden should be on you, the city representatives, to prove to us that we will be safe. Not to assure us with platitudes of we'll deal with any hazards as they arise, but to be able to say confidently, with documented proof, there is no risk. The ditch runs through the middle of a former Superfund site, but because it was paved over at the time of earlier remediation of nearby properties, we don't know for certain what lies below, and it has been omitted from the EPA's operating unit one that surrounds it. The Pinion Soil Investigation Report states the number of samples collected in their analysis is representative of a small proportion of the material that will be included in the Platte to Park Hill project and is a potential data gate gap. 
I've been aware of this project since it was first presented to us at the Cole Neighborhood Association meeting in November 2015, even though discussions and planning began months earlier. Since then, we have raised numerous concerns about the project, including the excavation of the 39th Avenue ditch. As a resident of Cole, I feel like an afterthought at best, or that I'm seen as a hysterical conspiracy theorist at worst. Our concerns and protests are a byproduct of a process that is being literally bulldozed through by an administration that appears beholden to developers before any others. So I ask you once again to please listen to us, to actually hear us, Ms. Moya. and to fulfill your responsibility to keep us safe. Thank Do you, you agree? Would you please stand? All right. Justin Feeder. Hi, my name is Justin Feider. Um, I live at 1777 East 39th Avenue. Can you pull your mic up so we can better yeah, hear you? Yep. Can you hear me now? Yep. <clears throat> I'm a board member of the Rock Trail Lofts HOA. And pending everything uh, Ms. Moya just said and that the design of the 39th channel happens per the design that's been shown thus far, um, that we, we approve the park and think it'd be a great amenity for coal. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, Jeff Romeo. I ask anyone who's for saving the Park Hill Golf Course to please stand right now. My name is Jeff Romeo. I'm a resident of the Overlook at Park Hill, and I currently sit on our HOA board. My wife and I led the mass migration to Denver some five years ago in search of greater opportunity. We were blessed to call Denver our home and couldn't be happier with our choice to buy our first house on the north end of Dexter Court overlooking the Park Hill Golf Course. While it's clear we will be directly affected by any development of the Park Hill Golf Course, including the water detention plan on the northeast end of the property, I'm not here to talk about me. I'm not here to tell you I'd like to continue to see the Rocky Mountains from my house or how I've been involved in a car accident on the corner of 35th and Colorado like many before me due to the awful traffic conditions that already sit there. I'm here though to address a bigger issue that affects not just my neighborhood but the community and the nation that surrounds it. And that is the issue of our physical and our mental health and the lack of spaces that allow adults to play. We already know that exercise is scientifically proven to reduce anxiety, stress, and depression. We also know that being in nature leads to many physical and mental benefits. I don't need to throw all those statistics out. But what you don't hear often is how adults, especially those living in big cities, lack access to spaces that provide opportunity for play. With City Park Golf Course closing, Denver is slowly eliminating spaces for play. Not everyone can afford skiing and biking in the mountain. This amazing city known for its outdoor beauty and active lifestyle is devaluing how significant spaces that provide joy, energy, and competition for adults really are. Play is more than about having fun. The state of social play brings us sanity. Play allows us to uh, problem solve, decompress, and unplug from the screens and the stresses of our daily lives. It leads to higher productivity, lower anxiety, and simply a happy, happier life. It enhances creative thinking and innovation. The Denver metro area has plenty of space for development, but not for open space. The Park Hill Golf Course is a direct reflection of the wonderful, diverse community that is Park Hill. While the golf course and banquet center certainly need a major facelift and to be pulling in more money each year, the potential to make it a thriving community space is huge. It is a priceless sanctuary where people come to relax, vent, celebrate, practice, compete with themselves, and strive to be better. Take away that space, and you're taking away something sacred we're quickly losing, our connection with the earth, the community, and the importance of play. Spaces to calm our busy minds and to let go in the warm sun, to enjoy stunning snow peak mountain views, crisp fresh air year round. Spaces that teach vision, confidence, action, follow through, and consistency. Currently, I have a signed petition circulating along with a non scientific survey gathering all nearby residents that are simply against the development of this space. I'm proud to say that we've already, uh, already nearing about a thousand people against the development and this is just after a month of circulation the people want to be heard and they don't feel they are this is my small way of providing a platform for them to voice their opinion without opening a can of worms with a hundred different ideas of what to turn that land into I'm on the front lines I'm talking with the neighbors directly I see the relief in the community gets from being out in the fresh air on real grass not artificial turf Mr. Roman please keep one of Mr. Denver's Mayo. last outdoor playgrounds alive Sir. because in this crazy stressful world we live in Sir. we're all buried in our phones your and fighting time, for human your time connection. is up Never Never before has it been more important for spaces Sir, of play, your disconnection, time is and community. Up. Thank you for your time. Hey, so, li so listen, I, we're going to extend the time to make sure everybody gets in, but you've got to at least be within the time uh, uh, 
monitors, right? So three minutes, please, okay? We want to respect everybody's time. I'm respecting your time. We're going to call the next five up. Charlotte Brantley, Janet Fetter, Pastor Dale Phillips, Becca Terlo, sorry if I mispronounced your name, and Garrett Sullivan. All right. Uh, Ms. Brantley, you are up. Good evening, Council President Brooks and members of the Council. I'm Charlotte Brantley, President and CEO of Clayton Early Learning, and I'm here to speak on uh, 1396. The nonprofit that I lead helps ensure a quality and effective early learning and care experience for some of the most vulnerable children in Denver. We are also the trustee of the George W. Clayton Trust. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about the LAO for a portion of the property currently occupied by the Park Hill Golf Course. As you are aware, this land, this land has been an asset of the Clayton Trust since Mr. Clayton's death in 1899, and its use was changed from agriculture to golf by the city as then trustee of the trust in about 1930. At that time, golf play was seen as the best use of the land to generate revenue in support of the young children who are the beneficiaries of Mr. Clayton's trust. We have partnered with the city for many years, both in providing services to vulnerable children through the Head Start program and in managing this property to ensure it contributes, uh, to, to ensure it continues to be leveraged in support of the beneficiaries of the trust as Mr. Clayton envisioned his assets would be used after his death. For several years, we have been aware of the city's need for land to solve the flooding that occurs in the Park Hill Basin. We and some of the families we serve have witnessed this flooding firsthand. In addition, we are aware that the northeast corner of the property is a natural low spot and water pools there every time the summer rains come. Therefore, we support this land acquisition ordinance. As the city moves forward with design of the stormwater facility, we ask that you keep in mind that the purpose of this property is to support the beneficiaries of Mr. Clayton's trust. As you know, we have been and will continue to be engaged in a community visioning process for potential future uses of this property. While the exact timing of any potential future alternative uses of the property is not presently known, we hope that the stormwater planning process will be such that future considerations of the highest and best use of the property as a trust asset will be kept in mind. We'd also like to ask that, you continue, that we continue to be involved in the input process for the stormwater planning. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Brantley. Um, Janet Fetter. Good evening, my name is Janet Fetter. I'm speaking on Bill 1396. I live on Gilpin Street, about two feet away from the proposed 39th Avenue open channel. Since I last spoke to you two weeks ago, I discovered that old maps of my neighborhood at the Denver Public Library reveal in the empty paved lot, paved over lot next to my home, there once stood a duplex built sometime around the year of construction of my own home in the 1890s. When digging for the 39th Avenue Greenway begins and the pavement comes up, the stone foundation to that duplex and whatever else was paved over will need to be excavated. One block to the east of me, the lot at the end of Williams, there stood, as my neighbor, Mr. Ed Armijo, has repeatedly said, a gasoline filling station. Absent any evidence of its removal, the pavement comes up there. We expect to find a leaky, leaded holding tank. Please hear me, it's not the presence of these things that trouble me. It's the absence of curiosity, investigation, and transparency on part of the EPA and the attendant unwillingness to advocate for the well-being of the coal community that has me so concerned. What would that advocacy look like? It would look like the EPA reclassifying these lots as part of the OU1 or creating an OU4 specifically for these parcels along 39th Avenue that previously went unclassified and need to be treated as the paved over industrial and residential lots they are. They need to be tested for contaminants. Now their designation has changed and that land is going to become the 39th Avenue Greenway. The EPA needs to treat them with the same care they showed to residential yards and parks quite simply because as we're told, 39th Avenue is going to become a park. There is a shell game happening here. We can see it and we're trying to stop it because we all know who wins at shell games. So who are we? We are citizens with careers in a broad variety of fields. We are parents and retired folk. We are the self-employed and people who work for other people. We have both growing and aging families who need us first. It took us a while to get up to speed with the reams of data pertaining to soil and water and chemical contamination and the processes of city and federal government. We made our discoveries in fits and starts. We forged our acquaintances with each other as we shared and pondered the information spooned out to us at monthly meetings. We stayed in touch, we grew stronger and smarter. Many of us now communicate several times a day. 
the people in my community are being treated disrespectfully. We are not a sleepy, impoverished community happy for handouts. We are a coalesced group of concerned citizens who have found each other. We found experts themselves concerned and also experienced to advise us. All of us spend hours upon hours to understand what is happening around us, not paid a penny, while we face off against omnipotent acting planners and power brokers, representatives of government and a Goliath-sized project. We've concluded that absent a full environmental risk analysis of this project as required by federal law, neither us nor SEMA nor anyone else can know what we're in for. Continuing to proceed is both fiscally and environmentally irresponsible. We are asking that you protect us and make decisions in our best interest. We've caught you not doing that. We are here to hold you accountable to the people who elected you to office, who pay your salaries, who you promised to serve. Ms. Fetter. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Pastor Dale Phillips. Councilman Brooks and to all the uh, council persons present, I'm Pastor Dale Phillips. I am the chairman of the Colorado Black Leadership Caucus, a, an organization that comprises about 15 um, major community organizations that are part of the African American community. In the uh, uh, brief two minutes and 42 seconds that I have, I want to try to uh, review three important points that I want to make in regards to support for Bill 1396. The first is uh, I do have an affinity and support for uh, what the Clayton College uh, project is trying to do in harnessing the best resources from this property to continue their work uh, with the constituents in that community, namely families from uh, uh, impoverished families that are given an opportunity for early childhood education. As much as I am in support of that, uh, that venue, I have even a greater ideal that concerns me, even about the conversation that's taking place today, which leads to my second point, um, and that's the uh, argument regarding open space versus residential space. Very easy for people who have a home to make a decision for people who don't have homes to not have the opportunity to find residents in that particular part of our community. To be able to talk about open space versus residential space, I think is a, a, a great overlook of one of the greatest challenges we have in the Denver community, and that's providing housing for people who need it. We don't need more open space. We need residential space so that those who are having to live in open space because they don't have a home can potentially find residency. So I think that's important for the council to consider one of the opportunities engaging uh, with the project with Clayton gives us at least the possibility of creating residential uh, affordable housing for people in that community, which leads to my last point. There have been conversations or even concerns about whether or not uh, Clayton should be engaged with the city uh, in trying to create this kind of partnership, which would only leave the other alternative to bring in an outside developer uh, to try to coordinate what, sh what would be best uh, placed there in that area. I want to be on record uh, saying that if we have to choose between a partnership uh, from an outside developer or the city. I am on board for working with the city because I feel as we are doing here tonight, we can hold you accountable for what we want to see happen in that uh, quadrant of our city to be able to bring what's needed, a balance of residential property, a balance of open space, a balance of uh, business space in that community. And we thank you for your support. All right, thank you, Pastor Dale Phillips. All right, Becca Turlow. I'm sorry if I misread. It's very close. And everybody makes this look really easy, so I'm just going to own that this is terrifying to me. So my name is Becca Turlow, and I live in the Clayton neighborhood. I'm the vice president of the Clayton Registered Neighborhood Association. I also serve on the Park Hill Citizens Advisory Committee. So I'm speaking about both issues, the first one being with 13, excuse me, 1396. Um, Clayton has been actively involved in the process with, sorry, Clayton Neighborhood has been actively involved with the Clayton Early Learning process um, for over a year. Um, we are very much in support of the bill of the city utilizing approximately 25 acres for permanent detention with the remaining area needed for temporary construction purposes. Um, I really want to take an opportunity to note that Clayton Neighborhood is excited about the opportunity to partner on the prospect for how this land will be used strategically. 
I'm confident that early, excuse me, Clayton Early Learning is providing a much needed high quality service um, to families in our neighborhood, but also to families outside of it. And we do or I do encourage and ask for um, yes and support on that. 1395 is trickier. Um, two things. Oh, I am nervous. I'm so sorry. But um, so we do, we, um, I do want to say that we have definitely been invited to be a part of the process and the planning process with that from the get go. Um, the stormwater systems team has presented at Clayton meetings on multiple occasions um, and included our feedback as far as the stakeholder working group goes. And we've been able to share our priorities for the new space. We also know that there's been intentions to build relationships with affected businesses in the community. That said, our neighbors have done so much work, put in so much time and energy in researching this piece around the EPA, the safety and the security. And the fact that we have neighbors who go to work every day, come home and take care of their kids and they're spending hours advocating, seeking data, seeking information to make sure this is safe is something that should be should be paid attention to. Um, so while we really appreciate the process that's happened so far, I definitely agree that we need more data and more evidence and a better analysis to say that what's about to happen in coal is safe for the families and for the children who live in that neighborhood. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Sorry. All right. Great job, Mr. Lau. All right, uh, Garrett Sullivan. Good evening, Council. My name is Garrett Sullivan. I am a member of the Park Hill Overlook, Overlook at Park Hill uh, HOA Association, and um, I am speaking um, regarding the preservation of open space, or at least the concept of open space in that area. Uh, if it's not returned to a golf course, um, I believe that uh, we will be losing an important resource. Mr. Romero spoke to all the health benefits of open space, and I just want to second that, that um, the remainder of the property that is not used for water mitigation and uh, storage of uh, stormwater be returned as efficiently as possible to um, a golf course or an alternative use of open space, not to development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Okay, thank you all. I'm gonna call the next five up. Uh, Kimberly Morse, Mike Matheson, Kevin Doyle, and Rex Candy, and Ed Armijo. Ms. Morse, you're up first. My name's Kimberly Morse. I live in the Cole neighborhood, and I have a question for you. Has there been a misuse of taxpayer dollars or possibly an environmental cover-up and what might this mean for other environmentally compromised areas of Denver? Although pre-excavation testing at Global reported 1% of one sample contained asbestos, the project budget allocated $255,000 for an asbestos inspector to be on site and $2 million for the removal of regulated asbestos contaminated soil, a much more costly disposal designation than ordinary soil. Through October, more than 80,000 cubic yards of asbestos contaminated soil has been removed. So are taxpayer dollars being misused for the soil removal? Or is the asbestos label being used as a pretext for other nasty debris and contamination at the Globeville site? And what precedent might this set for the 39th Avenue segment of the project? An ambitious drainage project is set to get underway inside of an area in Northeast Denver that Although designated a highly contaminated Superfund site in 1999, has yet to be fully studied nor cleaned up. My own multiple direct request to representatives of the EPA, CDPHE, and Denver starting in 2016 to press the pause button and conduct a full environmental study, particularly for the 39th Avenue segment of the project, have been met with silence or no's. Some agency employees will dismiss my environmental concerns as unrealistic because Northeast Denver has been an urban area for more than a century, but Denver City Council, you should not and cannot accept this as our legacy or our heritage. And what about that Swansea smelter on the map I just gave to you? I found it on an 1880s map of Denver, but I haven't seen any environmental documentation on the impacts this smelter may have had on Swansea coal or other close by neighborhoods. So before you sign that $78 million contract to authorize work in an area full of unknowns, I urge you to exercise your fiscal responsibility for ensuring taxpayer dollars are wisely spent, cost overruns are avoided, and that you ensure environmental protections for your constituents by requiring a full environmental study of the 39th Avenue channel. With only, oh, I have one left. 
have something else important. So there were three borings done. That's the extent of the testing that was done by your contractors in the coal segment. Three borings in coal, that's it. And as we learn, Janet's fence is gonna be taken down. That's how close this is gonna be. So with only three borings, lots of unanswered questions by Denver and local agencies, significant discrepancies in coal Global, I don't feel comfortable nor safe knowing this project is about to get underway so close to my home and that of my neighbors. Taxpayers and residents alike are on the hook for this very expensive project, and some have more on the line than just our tax dollars. We have our health and our property values. So council members, if, I've, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Morse. Mike Matheson. Hi, city council. Uh, my name is Mike Matheson. I did wanna say um, I love the Western wear tonight. Um, I, uh, I recall not too long ago, the stock show was very close to going to Aurora, and I'm very proud that it's still here in Denver. It's within a mile or so of my house, and that, uh, that took all of you to be able to do that, and I'm very appreciative of that. So I wanted to bring that up first. As far as, um, as, far as uh, Council Bill 1395 and 1396, I am in support of that. Um, I live in the 80216 zip code and I own land over in this area as well and I think you guys have read reports that it's one of the most contaminated um, zip codes in the country and so I'm very happy that this area is going to be cleaned up um, I view it as additional parkland that we're gaining in this area versus losing parkland and plus we're getting the golf course um, redone so um, removing contamination from an area that I live in an area I go to every day being able to have a park that I can ride my bike go with my daughter uh, I think is a great benefit um, in addition, um, I've had experience with contaminated sites and cleaning up contaminated sites and finding additional contamination and getting no further action letters from the state. And it does create work, but you, unless you dig that stuff up, um, it does leak down into the ground, groundwater. It's very hard to remove. And this, these types of projects is what cleans up zip codes like the one that I live in. And so I'm very happy to see that, that occurring. Um, I love the additional open space. Um, the CEO for Clayton Trust uh, supports uh, this project. And uh, it's, I, I know because I'm involved with some of the neighborhood outreach and involvement that the city has been doing this for a couple years. And I'm very appreciative to be involved and informed. And uh, you know, thank you for uh, putting this project together and helping clean up our city. All right, thank you, Ms. Mr. Matheson. Uh, Kevin Doyle. Thanks for the opportunity. My name's Kevin Doyle. I bought in the Overlook at Park Hill in 2002 with my wife, and we started our family there. Kaufman and Broad Homes, KB Homes, bought that land from the Clayton Foundation at the time, and they did it because the conservation, conservation easement was put in place. Without that easement that we're talking about dismantling, my neighborhood wouldn't even be there. And we're one of the most unique and best neighborhoods in Denver. We're an owner-occupied neighborhood, so we don't have a deed restriction, but we do have a covenant put in place by Clayton, by the city of Denver, and by Kaufman and Road Homes to make sure we were different. <laughs> you, you have to sign a waiver that says you're going to be owner-occupied when you move into my neighborhood. The, our values are not the same. Kaufman and Broad did that so that people earning 70 to 80 percent of the area median income could afford in my neighborhood, and they did. I did. And that's still, today, right now, average single family home in my neighborhood goes for $254 to $268 a square foot. If you jump on the other side of Martin Luther King, you're looking at 300 bucks, 350 bucks a square foot. We are affordable housing. That was what we had to be put in for. I, I want you guys to know that. As people talk about the need for affordable housing, I want to reiterate the need for open space and remind everyone that City of Council, City of Denver was involved in this. And the last time that the city of Denver and Clayton um, were free to range in the 80s, the attorney general had to get involved and stop this. I'm not sure Clayton should be involved. I'm not sure any development should happen whatsoever. And I'm not in favor of the land acquisition ordinance at all. Um, I'm not in favor of our conservation easement going away. I just learned last month that our conservation easement is in serious jeopardy. That was not the case when I bought. Our entire neighborhood was sold based on that. Um, We've reached out and we've done our own surveys, as Jeff Romeo has told you. We have almost a thousand signatures that are opposed to you know, the development of Park Hill Golf Course. My counterpart, David Martin, over at Park Hill Village, he represents three different HOAs. He couldn't be here today, but I'm sure he'd be saying the same thing if he could. Um, 
they're going to close down the golf course? Where are you going to put all the equipment? Behind my house? My easement that I paid for along with the rest of my residents, we have over $430,000 into maintaining an easement that we put in place. I have been trying to find out what's going to happen to that easement since day one. No one has been able to tell me that. No one. And I, I've got an email here that I sent to you guys, uh, City of Denver, um, in 2015, saying we are deeply, gravely concerned about the future of our community. That's in 2015. And I, we were the last to get involved in this. We were the last to be a part of Clayton's, um, you know, PCAT committee. That, that's fine. And we are, you know, blessed to have the opportunity to be involved in this. But you guys need to realize that we've been trying to get in front of this. And Mr. springing Doyle, this on us your is, is disappointing. Up. And I urge you to vote both these measures down. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. <laughs> okay, uh, Rex Kennedy. I'm sorry for I Yes, Council, this is uh, Rex Kennedy. Kennedy. And, and I'm very honored to speak to each one of you individuals here. I'm a longtime mes um, resident of Denver and city and county of Denver. I've been here since 1972. I'm a licensed architect and a, a parent of two uh, children at Clayton. And I'm also the uh, chair of Clayton's Parent Policy Council. I represent hundreds of children and hundreds of uh, parents. I would ask them to stand, but you know, they're, the city's working poor. They can't attend these types of events, but I am talking for them. We wanna say that we do, we do support the city's land acquisition of the Park Hill Golf Course. It's a golf course, it's an area that's owned by, uh, by Clayton, and it's used to fund the mission of Clayton. And, and the mission of Clayton is, of course, as you know, to serve Denver's working families and Denver's zero to age children that can't afford uh, proper daycare. It does a fantastic job. My child has been there since uh, the, the age of nine months and now she is thriving and ready for kindergarten. I have a two year old foster to adopt son who's been there for, for a year now and he has so far uh, has fantastic, has uh, adjusted fantastically because of Clayton. So I would like you to know that the, the uh, family members and the children of Clayton would like to support you as you move forward with the, the purchase of your land acquisition at Park Hill for stormwater planning, uh, as long as you know that the area, as long as special interests want to keep it 100% open space, that type of development is probably not going to be able to support the true mission of Clayton, the trust of Clayton, and also the children of Clayton. If it's left open space and we have no, no, no resources to, to, uh, to, to raise funds to support Clayton, that mission that was, that was created by Mr. Clayton in 1899 will die. So I just wanted to let you know that is what's on our mind and what is our greatest concern. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Ed Armijo. <clears throat> Good evening, Councilman, Councilwomen. My name's Ed Armijo, 3647 High Street. <coughs> Instead of me ranting and raving, I put my thoughts together because evidently the majority of you do not listen. Please pay attention. It is all hand in hand. Good evening, I am very concerned about the 39th Avenue project, both bills. There has been many poisonous chemicals released in the area for more than a century. I was poisoned in Vietnam with Agent Orange, poisoned, poisoned. I did not find out until 2006. I have a miserable lifestyle now. In Da Nang, Vietnam, to this day, there are thousands of children that are so deformed, their families abandon them because they were poisoned. The air base in Da Nang has been covered with concrete to stop the spread of Agent Orange. It was in the water, and it still is, and the food supply chain. It was too late, poison. Most of the Vietnam veterans were exposed. They carry the poison in their DNA. 
it is passed on to our children. My sons have DNA I carry. My eldest son has a child that is affected. He is mentally slow and his, ba his brain is bigger than his skull to fit in. I have, non, I have a non-biological grandson I raised since birth. He is 25 now. He's got the mentality of a seven-year-old and he's got medical issues. His real grandfather died of cancer due to Agent Orange poisoning. Pay attention, poisoning. His grandson is also affected. That's the grandson I am raising. Think about the earth you are going to disturb. No telling what is going to be released. You have kids, you have grandkids. Some of you have probably have great grandkids. Put yourself in our shoes that are fighting this. Think about, uh, how would you feel if you knew your kids were exposed to poison and you knew you could have, you knew you should have stopped it? Think with your heart, not with your pocket, not hanging around with all these developers because I've seen a number of you after some of these meetings wouldn't talk to me, but you was buddy-buddy with the developers. Here's one resolution. So, Mr. Armiel, thank you for your time. Let me read my resolution because this is very important to the audience or I'll just pass it on. I'm sorry, we got more folks right behind you. Thank you, sir. All right, the next five, Debbie James, Jason Jans, Jay Morse, and Maria Flora. Lastly, Brad Cameron. Jason, oh, Debbie James, you are up first. Debbie James, Miss James, you're up first. Hi. Go ahead. I'm Debbie James. I live on the Sixth Avenue Parkway in Mayfair Park neighborhood, which is adjacent to Lowry. A few years ago, I looked out my front window and saw men standing in my yard. I went outside and asked what they were doing. They said they were from Denver Wastewater Management and they were looking at my property as a place to run through with a concrete ditch, which would drain all of Mayfair Park's large storm events. These large storms have been flooding my, neighbors, my three neighbors' homes to the south for years. Alarmed, I mentioned that Mayfair Park had never had a comprehensive stormwater plan, and why didn't we deserve storm drains, pipes, and the rest of the infrastructure that most of the rest of the neighborhoods in Denver enjoyed? I was told that the concrete ditch was what wastewater was going to do to solve the problem of flooding in Mayfair Park. I told them to budget extra money to cover the lawsuit I intended to file. This is what I learned to do after working for nine years on the redevelopment of the Lowry Air Force Base. When the wealthy and developers colluded with the city to make lives of citizens in the adjacent affected neighborhoods miserable. We citizens in Mayfair Park fought back and as a result I was told by Jim Meadows, director of Lowry Redevelopment Authority, that the LRA board thought you people in Mayfair Park were too poor and uneducated to give us any trouble. A short time after the wastewater men's visit, my husband and our neighbors to the west and I were invited to a meeting. We were advised that the project was going forward. It would entail a 10 foot wide, three foot deep concrete ditch running window well to window well between our two homes. My neighbor demanded to know what would happen when the ditch overflowed. He was rebuffed. My husband and I were advised that we would have to, at our own expense, cut down 50-year-old trees and shrubs, tear out our redwood privacy fence, and demolish an art studio, which all stood in the way of where the city would put its concrete ditch. Since we had dared place these amenities on our own property over an easement, despite improvements being done following Denver City Code. We were given site maps, and later I noticed that the easement was for sanitary sewer, not wastewater. My neighbor, who's an attorney, drafted a letter and so did my husband and I. The end of the story is that all of a sudden, the city found money to install comprehensive wastewater infrastructure in Mayfair Park, which includes immense underground cisterns that hold big flood events until they can disperse onward. How this happened is still a mystery, but now an even worse plan for a ditch is being forced on other neighborhoods. 
Because we citizens are left in the dark until unwanted projects are about to unfold in our communities, then we are chided for being too late to respond and further on told that our responses are inadequate. But tonight, members of City Council, you have a chance to set things right. We, the oppressed and trampled on citizens of Denver, appeal to your hearts and compassion to do the right thing by calling a halt to the travesty of the 39th Avenue ditch. We citizens Ms. are fed Ms. up James. with being treated contemptuously Ms. by public officials who hand some salaries we pay. I urge you to vote no. Thank you, Ms. James. Jason Jantz. My name is Jason Jantz. I am a resident at 2938 uh, Humboldt Street. I've lived in Northeast Denver uh, for the past 10 years, and I'm the CEO of Cross Purpose, which is a career and community development program that helps 100 families, mainly in Northeast Denver, uh, move out of poverty and get a middle-class income within 12 months. We also uh, are one of the largest tenants on the current Clayton campus. Um, and I'm a member of the PCAC uh, Park Hill Advisory Council. Um, regarding uh, 1396, my request is simply that the decision that is made on the land be used to further the mission uh, of Clayton for these children. Uh, Clayton must thrive. They educate hundreds of children. And early childhood we know is essential to the children in our city, especially those who are most vulnerable to get a great education. And I believe Clayton, after working with, been on their campus for the last six years, that they invest uh, serious uh, effort and finances to do whatever it takes to get kids, especially from vulnerable backgrounds, kindergarten ready. And so I, my heart goes out to them, and I just want to make sure that that mission goes forward. We are currently working with them to pilot a two-generation approach to poverty, whereas even some of our uh, adults that we are working with drop their kids off at their learning center, and then the parents walk across the yard, and they join a career development program, and we're seeing generational poverty being changed on that campus. Many, if not all of us in the neighborhood would like to preserve a good portion of the property for parks and open space. The extent of how much is probably the rub and we look forward to a continued strong collaborative process to figure that out. And this is a complicated issue that many of us have a hard time keeping up with as many of my neighbors have testified here to tonight, but I would just ask that in the decision you make that you really put the forefront of the mission of Clayton as they serve the kids in the forefront of your mind. And by protecting their mission, you protect and provide for families that are vulnerable in our neighborhood. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Jantz. Uh, Jay Morse. Good evening, Council. My name is Jay Morse, I'm Cole resident. And I just want to express my support for the Cole neighbors in requesting that Council hold back its vote on the $78 million SEMA contract until a <coughs> thorough environmental study has been conducted. This is a Superfund site. The EPA does not throw around Superfund site lightly. So please consider that when you start looking at these contracts. Three borings, as Kimberly said, that's it. Only three borings. There's a lot of poison out there. So I ask that you take that in consideration and put a pause on this vote until a full environmental impact study can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morse. Maria Flora. Good evening. My name's Maria Flora. I live at 2060 Albion Street. <clears throat> I'm here to, to oppose 171396. I'm an open space advocate. I'm opposed because of my concern for the effect of this ordinance on that open space conservation easement that the city acquired in 1997 for $2 million. I don't believe that council has been adequately informed as to the effect that this ordinance is going to potentially have on that conservation easement and the resulting loss of open space. Now, each of you council members received an email from Woody Garnsey on December 16 of this year, of last year rather, about the legal issues surrounding the conservation easement and the condemnation clause in the conservation easement itself. Mr. Garnsey warned of the council's inadvertent termination of that conservation easement by exercising the right of eminent domain on that property. Um, 
and the concomitant loss of the $2 million investment that the city has made in that conservation easement and the loss of any opportunity, potentially, to preserve that as open space by starting this condemnation process. I ask Council to be advocates for the citizens of Denver in preserving this conservation easement, at least for the present time. Now, in the conservation easement itself, there is what we call a condemnation clause. And I don't know if you all have read the agency agreement, the conservation easement, all of these documents over the years that have come forward in this mess over the Park Hill Golf Course and the relationship with Clayton College in the city of Denver. It's an embarrassing mess. But there is a condemnation clause in the easement, and it says that if there is uh, a taking to the exercise of the power of, of eminent domain by the city so that the golf course is no longer physically uh, capable of being operated as a regulation 18-hole golf course and driving range on that land, then Clayton College has the right to terminate the conservation easement, period. Now, this clause doesn't say, well, it's okay if it's only for two years. It's okay if it's only a temporary easement on this part and a permanent easement on the rest. That's all left to interpretation. I was unsettled when I watched the video of the December 18, um, it's called the Finance and Government Ms. Committee. Floor. This, it was Ms. December Floor. 5. I'm Ms. Floor. sorry. Your, your time is I'm up, done. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All right, <laughs> Brad Cameron. Uh, I'm here to talk about Park Hill Golf Course, uh, and I thank you for that opportunity. My name is Brad Cameron. I reside at 1200 Humboldt Street, which is immediately adjacent to Cheeseman Park. I've lived there for over 20 years, and during that time, I have seen the public's use of Cheeseman Park increase dramatically. And Cheeseman Park is not, the, is not alone in that regard. All of Denver's large regional parks have seen similar increases. I'm not complaining. It's wonderful to see so many people using and enjoying Denver's park system, and especially so many young people. But Denver continues to grow in population. We are on track to add 100,000 new residents this decade, with downtown alone expected to have 20,000 housing units added between 2010 and 2020. And this is an exaggeration, but sometimes it does feel like on a summer weekend they're all in Cheeseman Park. Now that's why preservation of open space such as Park Hill Golf Course is so important. To continue to be an attractive city for existing residents, it's imperative that Denver maintain and protect the open space that we already have. That certainly was the vision of Mayor Wellington Webb, who, with the help of City Council, back in 1997, led the city in its purchase of a conservation easement to protect, in perpetuity, the open space of Park Hill Golf Course from development. That conservation easement cost the citizens of Denver $2 million, which at the time was its fair market value. And that was an arm's length transaction that Clayton knowingly entered into. Now today the benefits of that conservation easement are more important than ever. The land acquisition ordinance before you today most likely in my opinion will not in and of itself threaten the open space of the golf course. But there are few who think that this will be the final chapter of the story. A return to talk of developing Park Hill Golf Course is clearly in the wind. Now finally, I want to echo the comments made by Councilwoman Kanish back in early December when this matter was before the Finance and Governance Committee. Her request was that in the future there be more transparency on the part of the Hancock administration when dealing with Park Hill Golf Course matters. Obviously that is not entirely within the power of City Council but hopefully all of you will join Councilwoman Kanich in requesting that from Mayor Hancock. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. All right.
we're going to call the next, um, let's see here, next five? All right. We'll call the next five people up. Kathleen Wales, Eris Shiner, Sheener, Woody Garnsey, Georgia Garnsey, Chairman Sekou, and the last person I'm going to call up is uh, Lois Dahl. These are our last six here. Ms. Wells, you are first. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Wells. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking tonight about the golf course. The Denver mayor is among the 388 U.S. mayors who have pledged to adopt the Paris Climate Accord. These mayors agreed in June of this past year they would refuse to endorse any executive order that rolled back policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions because to enforce such policies would threaten every American community's health and safety. Now, the city of Denver recognizes climate change as a defining issue of the 21st century and the city is committed to facing the challenges of a changing climate through preparedness. These facts have everything to do with tonight's discussion of the preservation or demolition of the 155-acre Park Hill golf course. Why? Because trees, grass, and natural vegetation absorb carbon dioxide and therefore reduce the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere that contributes to global warming. The more open green space we have, the better able we are to mitigate and to adapt to climate change. Why should we care? Colorado will warm four degrees by 2050, causing loss of vegetation, reduced water quality, enhanced ground level ozone concentrations, and human health problems. If you think climate change is real but will occur sometime in the very distant future, talk to me after this hearing. And I'll tell you about my sister who's moving from rural southern Arizona, a place she loves, due to the threat that increasingly severe heat, wildfires, smoke, and dust pose, not only to her way of life, but also to her ability to breathe. We have to meet the climate change challenge. It seems simply incredible a city that is landlocked would waste a golden opportunity to maintain a golf course or to create a regional park in light of the serious climate problems we face. A decision to develop rather than to preserve or expand green space would be an example of a seemingly innocuous or even positive public policy decision that, in the end, is at odds with our community's best interest in the most fundamental sense. Our growing population of young people, most of whom want more open green space, love the outdoors, are committed to environmental, including climate-related causes, understand this issue better than any other demographic. Perhaps it's not therefore surprising. Wells, that, sorry, thank you so much. Up. Thank you. Uh, next up, Aris Shiner. Uh, good evening. My name is Eris Shiner, and I'd like to lend my support to Council Resolution 1395. I've lived in central Denver for my entire life, and although I'm a new resident of Cole, um, my wife, Charlotte, and I now own and live at 3846 Gilpin, the house on the southeast corner of 39th and Gilpin, directly adjacent to the planned Greenway. I believe that the, that the Greenway and Open Channel is an excellent use of the land along 39th Avenue. While I do share some of the current concerns here expressed by some of my neighbors, especially concerning environmental hazards occurring during and after the construction of what will eventually become the park space where people and families will gather. That said, especially having seen the planned steps presented earlier, I have full confidence in the city of Denver to proceed responsibly, knowing that it is accountable to its citizens in the oversight of the project and to mitigate any hazards as they may arise. I look forward to the construction of this I look forward to the start of the construction and to a beautiful new greenway along a stretch of 39th Avenue in desperate need of renewal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Woody Garnsey. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Woody Garnsey. I'm a 
46 year Park Hill resident and a retired attorney. And I've had the pleasure of meeting with many of you over the past several months and I've sent emails to all of you in November and December regarding the issues that are in front of council tonight. Tonight I urge you to vote no or at least to table the proposed Park Hill Golf Course Condemnation Ordinance until the city administration guarantees you that a condemnation action will not jeopardize the open space conservation easement that was purchased by the city in 1997 for two million dollars. Under the agency agreement between the Clayton Trust and the city, the trust now holds title and quote, as agent of the city to hold for the benefit of the citizens of the city and the general public. The trust under the existing agreement has the unilateral legal right to terminate the agency agreement and thereby reacquire full title to the property. But at that time, the termination of that would result in the conservation easement coming back into place immediately. It's critical to the council's decision tonight that it knows that the trust has the legal right to terminate the conservation easement in the event the land is taken through exercise of eminent domain. The Clayton Trust could arguably terminate the easement in connection with this proposed uh, condemnation action by the city. The golf course operator Arcus has until June 30th to exercise its five-year lease extension option. In the meantime, Number one, the city, Clayton, and Arcus can hopefully resolve critical issues related to the city's plan to install the stormwater detention facility on this land and thereby eliminate the need for filing any condemnation action. And number two, there's no present need for the city to initiate a condemnation action that could jeopardize the conservation easement. Having never practiced condemnation law, I recently consulted with a very experienced condemnation lawyer in Denver. She advised me that the city can easily secure an immediate possession order in no, more, in no more than and likely fewer than 120 days from the filing of an action. Therefore, the city can easily wait until after June 30th to file a condemnation action if necessary and still begin construction of the stormwater detention facility after December 31st. The city created this problem when it decided to install the stormwater detention in the Park Hill Golf Course under the Park Hill, the Platte to Park Hill project. Now it must do whatever is necessary to guarantee that that conservation easement does not go away as a result of that action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garnsey. <laughs> Georgia Garnsey. Hello. My name is Georgia Garnsey. I'm a Park Hill resident. I'm a member of City Park Friends and Neighbors, a park advocacy group, and I am also serving on the PCAC. Um, I'm here to support the conservation of the Park Hill golf course as open land. Um, I love the way this meeting started because you addressed what I love so much about Denver, its history. When I came here 40 years ago, uh, I fell in love with the light, first off. I'd never seen anything like it, and I knew I'd found my place. And I loved the sheer guts and vitality of this place. Um, it's such a young city. It was founded in 1856. Uh, the history and the people that work so hard to shape it and lead it um, are so vivid and accessible to me. Um, the, the city's early commitment to open space particularly has astonished me as I've studied Denver history. And you have to wonder when all these traders and cowboys and farmers and whatnot came here, uh, it was empty. It was sand and tumbleweed and jackrabbits and cottonwoods and not much of anything. And they came and invested their hopes and their dreams and their love of this area um, to make something, to shape something wonderful, which is what we're experiencing today. In 1882, Mayor Sopras 
Uh, this is 25 years after the founding of the city, led an effort to purchase 320 acres of land in uh, where City Park resides today. And it was out in the boondocks. There was nothing out there. What inspired them? They, they knew that they wanted Denver to be something special. The 320 acres was not incidental. It's half what Central Park is. And that was intentional. They saw Denver as being competing with New York City and San Francisco. It was to be the Paris of the, of the Plains. Um, in 18, at the turn of the 20th century, Mayor Robert Speer came forward and he'd been inspired by the City Beautiful movement. And he implemented again another vision for open space of parklands connected by beautiful boulevards and parkways. Ms. Garnsey, I hate to interrupt ah. you because you're, you're on a roll, but... Well, um, I hope I've inspired you as the next leaders uh, of shaping this, this beautiful city to think about you. the open space. Thank you. All right, Chairman Sekou. Yes, <clears throat> Chairman Sekou, Black Star Action Movement for Self-Defense, representing poor, working poor, homeless, and senior citizens. You know, I, I, I don't want to be redundant and repeat a lot of stuff that's been said, but I heard one thing that was very disturbing. The people don't trust government. They don't trust it. Now, for some of you that are new, that's a serious caveat that you got to carry because of previous decisions and experiences that people have had with previous administrations and city council. And I was talking to a former uh, council member, and Paul, you know who I'm talking about. She said one of the issues that she had by serving 12 years on council was that she was very naive and that she accepted things on face value that was not true. And in the process, as she reviewed her term, she made a decision to come down and lobby city council members who were new to share with them, you need to do your homework, you need to see the context, and you need to pay attention as to what is being said within historical context. Now, we have a strong mayor position and a not so strong city council in terms of how decisions are made. So many times decisions are weighed down and, and they're convoluted because people actually in city council, and we've all seen it, vote for things that they're not necessarily for. Just on the strength of they want to get some stuff done. But now we got a serious situation here. All right. And that is city council, and I beseech you, must restore the confidence that the everyday people have in this body. And in the process of doing that, you're going to have to vote for some things that you don't care for, and yet at the same time, I'm suggesting to you, if you don't feel it, don't vote for it. Don't vote for it. Don't vote for this. Don't do that. Because in the process, you will continue on the legacy of destroying the people's confidence in this very institution. And this institution means more to the people than the people who come and go as elected officials. I've seen many come and go. But the people are always still here. They still come. And I've never in my life, for 65 years of living in this city, and I've lived all of my life on the east side from Five Points to Park Hill, Mr. I have Sekou. never seen an administration that would pit neighborhoods against one another and have people arguing about stuff when it requires teamwork. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sekou. Thank you, Ms. Sekou. All right, is Lois Dahl here? Okay. 
You are the last one. I have not lost. <laughs> no. Last but not least, um, Ms. Dahl. I am not going to try to speed, speed talk or read or anything. I have some information that I could say, but everybody else has said it already. I'm talking about the 39th Avenue uh, ditch. I live four blocks from there, and so I'm here as a selfish person, but selfish for my whole community. My daughter and her husband and my two grandchildren live a block from the ditch proposal. Um, I am very concerned that are not enough testing has been done, not enough EPA backing and interest in the situation of digging up a Superfund site and letting the stuff fly all over the place while it's being done. Um, I, we are told I started helping work on this in 2015. Uh, we're told, I've been to many, many meetings. We're told that, well, we're going to wet it down when we dig it up. Um, I don't feel like that's going to be the solution that might help. I just saw them wetting down the tram building as they were tearing it down on one end of it. Uh, the dust was flying everywhere, uh, including in my house. Uh, my grandsons are six years old and almost four. I have an interest in keeping their lungs pink and healthy. And as Ed said, you don't know what's going to happen 20 years down the road when your children, your grandchildren, and so forth are exposed to this kind of thing, flying in the air when it's dug up and scattered around. You don't know 20 years from now if they're going to have lung cancer or what else. I think it's really important for people who have the opportunity to safeguard our neighborhood to do it. You can put a hold on this until this testing is really done right. And so that we know that when it's dug up, if it's dug up, I hope it isn't, but if it is, if it's going to be done right so that it is not polluting our neighborhood. Uh, people have been living there for a lot longer than I have. Uh, they have children, grandchildren, and stuff living in the neighborhood also, and we're very worried about this. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I want to thank everyone uh, who, who stayed the entire time and, and spoke. Um, we have, we got to all of our speakers, and um, thanks for paying for parking, coming through security, sitting on those hard benches. Uh, you did a great job.